yeah so if you look at this picture i have uh, this is called hadoop ecosystem see uh, when i discussed about hadoop i told you that hadoop has three major components and you can see them in this picture with the elephant you know so the elephant is actually the symbol of hadoop so here you can see there is hdfs that is the hadoop distributed file system that's the storage part uh, then you have something called yarn yarn is used for resource management on top of that you have something called map reduce which is part of your data processing so by default when you download and install hadoop let's say anybody who download and install hadoop by default they are going to get hdfs plus yarn plus map reduce so if somebody ask you what is you know uh, hadoop you can safely say that hadoop is a combination of hdfs yarn and map reduce however hadoop was created in 2005 almost 15 years back and over the period of years a lot of tools were developed which can run on top of hadoop they are called hadoop ecosystem so hadoop ecosystem is basically hadoop and all the tools which you can install on top of hadoop now you may be wondering why should i install something on top of hadoop so there are many requirements and there are many kinds of tools that you have. Uh, I guess I should give you an overview about them, right? Uh, for example, if you look at this picture, HDFS, Yarn, MapReduce, the three things with the elephant symbol, that is Hadoop. Now, if you look at the, uh, what you say, left-hand side, right, in this part, uh, let me see if I can annotate, okay. Oops, I think. Can I draw? Yeah, I guess I'll be able to draw, right? So let me just check if I can draw. Mm, we'll pick up a white marker, yeah. So you can see that there is somebody called Uzi. I'm just circling this guy. There is somebody called Uzi. What is Uzi? Uzi is a workflow manager on top of Hadoop. What Uzi does is that if, so yesterday we have seen pig, right? And we also wrote some very basic pig programs. So very similar to that, uh, there can be pig, there can be spark, many other type of programs uh, that you can write on top of Hadoop, right? Now, let us suppose you have written a pig program and you want to run it every day at 12 o'clock midnight. Imagine just a requirement I'm saying. Then Uzi is the tool which will help you to do that. Uzi is a workflow manager, meaning it allows you to automate uh, the programs that are running on top of Hadoop. Uzi is not a programming language or an execution engine. What Uzi does is that it can take your program and run it for you on your behalf. Now, it can take any program that you want, a pig program, spark program, hive program, any program that you write on top of Hadoop, Uzi can take it, Uzi can combine it and run it for you. So some of the things that we do is that uh, in the production setup, sometimes what happens is that you might want to run a combination of programs like i want to first run a pig program once that is successful i want to run a spark program so you can combine or you can chain these programs using uzi uzi can run one program for you or even more than one program for you right so you can design something called workflow and then make it happen so i mean we don't have uzi in our syllabus but just to show you this you can just go to cloudx lab you just go to my lab go to hue 
well I, I don't want to demonstrate OZ, but i just want to you know show you what uh, how it looks like so i can just go here Mm, come on yeah so this is the uzi editor can you see this is called uzi editor so what you can do you can see you can add a hive script if you want if you add a hive script it will ask you for the location or you can add a pig job if you add a pig script here it will ask you the code of pig i can just drag and drop it will uh, ask for the code of pig or i can add a spark program or a Java program or, or any kind of programs, I can create something called workflows using Uzi. This is called Uzi editor. So this is Uzi, okay? So that is one of the uh, popular uh, products or, or one of the popular tools on top of Hadoop. So Uzi is a very popular tool, I can say. Now, uh, what are some of the other tools that you might be interested to see? For example, uh, there is another tool called Scoop. Here you can see Scoop, this guy. So Scoop is in our syllabus and we will see Scoop tomorrow. Okay, so tomorrow I will demonstrate Scoop so you can understand what it is, don't worry. Basically, it is a data collection tool. So when you want to collect the data or transfer the data, Scoop is one of the tool that you can use. Then you can see there is something called Flume here. Below scope, you have something called Flume. Flume is also a data collection tool. So Scoop and Flume, both are data collection tools. They are used to collect the data. Uh, and here you can see Pig and Hive here. You know, So this is Pig and then you can also see Hive. We will see Hive today. So Pig, we have already seen yesterday. It is sort of like a client side utility it is a scripting language you write something called pig script uh, it will convert to a map reduce job and run it in the cluster hive basically allows you to run sql query on hadoop and we will look at hive today don't worry now if you want to uh, do machine learning on top of hadoop there is a framework called Mahout, this guy, Mahout. So Mahout is a machine learning library on top of Hadoop. So machine learning is very common these days, right? So many people want to uh, build a machine learning models. So one of the ways in which you can do uh, machine learning on top of Hadoop is using something called Mahout. Uh, after that, you can see there is somebody called Drill. Drill is another SQL engine. Uh, the difference between Drill and Hive is that Drill is faster than Hive. So it can be used for interactive queries and so on and so forth. Okay. And then here you can see there is something called HBase. Uh, HBase is what we call a NoSQL database. So it is the default uh, NoSQL database on top of Hadoop. Uh, you can see somebody called Zookeeper here, this side at the bottom of this diagram, you can see Zookeeper. Uh, Zookeeper is a coordinator. Uh, it is not a developer's tool or something. Zookeeper is kind of like a coordination framework. So when you have all these services running in a Hadoop cluster, how do they talk to each other? How do they coordinate with each other? That is handled by Zookeeper. Then you have something called Ambari. Ambari I have shown, shown you already. So Ambari is here. You can see Ambari. Ambari will basically show you, uh, uh, it is like a administrator's UI to your Hadoop cluster. So once you log in to Ambari, you can actually see the, uh, what do you say? You can actually see the cluster. Basically, so Ambari will help you to look at the cluster. If you are an administrator, you can add machines, remove machines, all these things you can do using Ambari. So this is what we call Hadoop ecosystem tools. Okay, let me remove these drawings. 
Yeah, so this is what we call Hadoop ecosystem. So what is Hadoop ecosystem? It is Hadoop and all the tools you can install on top of Hadoop. Uh, does that mean these are the final list of tools you can install on Hadoop? No, this is just a partial list, okay? This does not cover all the uh, tools you can install on top of Hadoop. But maybe I can say the most commonly used tools you can find here. Okay. Uh, so uh, any any questions on this? Let me know. Any questions on this? No. Okay. Great. So uh, now what happened? So this is called Hadoop ecosystem tool. And now let us discuss today's topic, which is nothing but Apache Hive, right? So let me just go to full screen. Uh, yeah, so today we are going to discuss something called Hive, right? Let's see what it is. So Hive, is a data warehouse infrastructure which is built on top of uh, Hadoop, right? Uh, so what happens is that we already know that uh, Hadoop can store a huge amount of data and Hadoop can also store any kind of data that you want. What is Hive? It is a data warehouse which is built on top of Hadoop. To put it simply, Hive allows you to create tables on top of Hadoop and query the data using SQL. That is what is Hive. So if you want to analyze the data on top of Hadoop, okay, then one thing we saw yesterday was that you can use pig for sure. Uh, but what is the flip side of pig? Uh, you have to learn the language of pig, right? Not everybody understand uh, you know, uh, what is uh, the language of pig? It's actually very difficult to learn probably for some people. So Hive on the other hand allows SQL queries on Hadoop. So Hive is called the default data warehouse on top of Hadoop. Uh, and Hive in fact has its own language which is called HiveQL. So you look at this statement Hive provides a mechanism to project structure onto the data and query the data using SQL-like language called HiveQL. So it is written SQL-like language. Well, in fact, HiveQL is developed uh, by taking SQL as the base platform. It is very similar to SQL. HiveQL is very similar to your standard SQL, you know, there is very rare difference between them. And Hive uses MapReduce and HDFS for processing and storage. Very important point. Uh, why it is very important? Because, uh, see, Hive is basically projecting a structure or schema to the existing data on Hadoop. To give you an idea, let us say you are storing a CSV file in Hadoop. So if you store a CSV file in Hadoop, the file is already on HDFS. What Hive does, it allows you to create a table matching with the structure of the CSV file and apply that structure on the CSV file. Meaning Hive is actually using HDFS as the storage the base storage. So Hive is just kind of like projecting a structure or schema to the files that you have already stored in Hadoop. Also, Hive uses MapReduce. So when you are uh, writing a Hive query, you will be using SQL for sure. But end of the day, the SQL query is converted into a series of MapReduce jobs. So we can safely say that functionality wise, 
hive and pig are our same now hive actually became hive was created by facebook the company called facebook in 2007 so hadoop came in 2005 and hive came in 2007 and why did facebook create hive because facebook had lot of developers who were very much familiar with sql and writing map reduce programs were not easy for everyone see not everybody so that is the reason we uh, selected one tool called a pig right so hive and pig are very similar in the way they try to solve the problem both take your input uh, program and convert that into map reduce okay both both do the same thing however pig has its own language where hive has sql so if you ask me uh, working with hive is probably more comfortable because most of the people already know sql you don't have to learn sql and data warehousing industry has seen a paradigm shift after the introduction of hive so if you look at this picture you see a picture here right um, at least uh, do you guys know what is a data warehouse i mean just to get an idea do you know what is a data warehouse have you learned about them have you worked on them no so kabir here says no what about others are you guys aware of this i think no yeah so what happens uh, no problem so what happens is that in the traditional world so let me give you an example okay uh, like what is the importance of this data warehouse in the traditional world uh, take an example let us assume you are working for big bazaar so one of the company which we can easily relate to is what big bazaar right let's say you are working as the it uh, infrastructure guy for big bazaar now inside big bazaar there will be many many applications for example somebody could have created a billing application right so what happens when you go to a uh, big bazaar and then purchase whatever you want you go to the uh, uh, you know billing guy and he will bill that so definitely they are using a software for billing so there will be a billing system to give you an idea and let us assume that this billing system is actually storing the data inside my sql so every uh, application need a database to store the data right so my billing application in big bazaar is storing all the data inside mysql rdbms or you can say database called mysql now in big bazaar let us say there is an inventory uh, application okay let us say there is a inventory application what is the inventory application this basically keep tracks of like how many locations you have uh, in a big bazaar how many items you have inside big bazaar how many items you are shipping for example for a company like big bazaar it's very important to understand logistics and all maybe uh, see i am selling certain products for example right now it is lockdown so sanitizers everybody buy sanitizers so they have to understand how many sanitizers they have in the shop how many they have to procure you know how many are uh, shipped so all this is managed by an inventory application so let us say that the inventory application is storing all the data in microsoft sql microsoft sql now let us assume this big bazaar is also having a crm application what is crm customer relationship management meaning you have this your loyalty programs and all you know so uh, i don't know how many of you are aware of this if you go to big bazaar you can register as a 
regular customer, you will get a card and all. They will collect your name, date of birth, points, everything. So basically that system takes care of customer management. So they will send you more offers, they will give you rewards, etc. So CRM system is using another database. Let's say PostgreSQL. So, well, it is just an example, okay? I'm not saying that Big Bazaar is always working like this and they're using always these platforms. Yeah, payback, like payback, like Kabir says, right? So, I'm not saying that exactly it works like this, but in any production setup, it is highly common that there will be multiple applications and they store the data in multiple databases. Now, what is your problem if you are the manager or you are the CEO of the company, how do you get the whole data in one place? Because billing data is in MySQL, inventory data is in Microsoft SQL, CRM data in PostgreSQL. Uh, so one of the requirement will be that, let us say uh, you want to uh, uh, design, um, uh, you know, you want to find out let's say the top 10 customers who are spending a lot of money in Big Bazaar. So maybe you want to collect the data from all three platforms. You know, you want to look at the billing platform and how much they are spending. You want to look at the CRM platform, figure out their name, address, everything, right? Or, or something like that. So my problem is the data is actually lying in different, different places. I want to combine them. So usually what you do is that this is the place where you will be running an ETL tool. There is a process called ETL. Stands for extract, transform and load, right? So ETL is the process of, you know, bringing data from these different, different systems into a single platform. So that single platform is nothing but your data warehouse. So a data warehouse is nothing but, you can consider it like a big database, you know. Basically a data warehouse will have data coming from different, different operational stores like RDBMS systems. So all the data from hundreds of sources can be pulled using an ETL pipeline and dumped into the data warehouse. So in the data warehouse, what I can do is that I can create a table by combining all this different, different data. And once I have the table, I can probably connect, let's say a visualization tool, something like Tableau to visualize the data and get insights. So this is how traditionally things will work, usually, right? Shubham was saying, what is the difference between ETL and ELT? So this is called ETL. What I'm explaining is actually ETL. And this technique works in the traditional world. In the traditional world, you do this. No matter uh, whichever company you are working for, uh, if you are working in a regular domain, what you do is ETL and, and this. So ETL stands for extract, transform and load. In the big data world, we say we do ELT, extract, load, and transform. Meaning in the big data world, what we do is that we extract the data, store it in Hadoop, later transform the data. So it's just a matter of which platform you are actually using. But my point is, so traditionally, these data warehouses are a very important part of every company. Because in every company, you need a data warehouse where the data from multiple sources can be stored and probably queried later. The data warehouse also supports your SQL queries. Basically, you are creating tables and writing queries using SQL. Uh, but data warehouses are probably one of the most important part of uh, your traditional architecture. And, and uh, so accordingly, there was a lot of monopoly in the industry. So if you really look at the history of data warehouses, 
there are many companies who are actually giving this data warehousing solution. There is Oracle Data Warehouse, Microsoft Data Warehouse. There is something called Terra Data, Netiza, you know. So, so all these are data warehousing tools. So whether you are using Terra Data or Oracle or Microsoft SQL, all these are data warehousing solutions that we have. So over the period of years, there has been many platforms which started serving as a data warehouse because every company require one. But the flip side of this is that data warehouses are really costly. They charge a lot of money for licensing support and many other things. So even though data warehouses were there, a lot of money was being charged. Hive basically replaced this entire picture. So what is Hive? Hive is a data warehouse on top of Hadoop. So now we are saying that, hey, you already have the data on Hadoop. Why are you going to the traditional world and creating a data warehouse? You use this tool called Hive uh, and it will act as your data warehouse. What is the advantage? Your cost will be reduced uh, dramatically. So if you're using the traditional data warehousing solutions, there is a very high level of cost involved. If you are using Hive on top of Hadoop, the advantage is that already the data is in Hadoop, you don't have to do anything. Also, since Hive is an open source tool, Apache tool, it's almost like free. So with the invention of Hive, there was a major blow to the traditional data warehousing industry. So a lot of companies actually faced a lot of problems after the introduction of Hive because Hive, the customers actually started using Hive as their primary platform for data warehousing. So if you're getting a cheaper solution, which can also handle big data, then why are you going for Oracle or the traditional platform? So a lot of companies accordingly started using Apache Hive, right? Um, so Kabir is saying, which is the good tool for data warehouse? No, there is nothing like good tools. So this is like asking which mobile phone is good, right? So if I ask you, which mobile phone is good? See, all the mobile phones are basically serving the same purpose, right? Now there can be differences in configuration. For example, if you compare an iPhone with a normal, you know, 10,000 wala Android phone, iPhone is still better. So like that in data warehousing also, there are many companies. There is nothing like good actually. So all the companies are good in data warehousing. Shubham is saying data can be of any type, SQL, JSON, it is stored in a warehouse. Uh, no, primarily when you store the data, Shubham, the data will be in the structured format, row column format. Okay, you can read a JSON file and all, convert it into a table and store. Inside a data warehouse, everything has to be row and column. So now if we look at Hive, I think we will get a better idea. So this picture you see here is what I have been explaining. You see a picture here, uh, CRM building ERP, then ETL to data warehouse, then reporting. So that is what I was explaining. So all Hive queries will be converted to MapReduce job. So why can't we write MapReduce ourselves? End of the day, if you write a SQL query using Hive, it will be converted to MapReduce, then why don't you directly write it? That is because writing MapReduce is tough, right? Writing MapReduce is really tough. That is why we are using something like Hive, okay? And let us look at some advantages of Hive. It is an efficient ETL tool. Hive is a data warehouse, right? At the same time, it also allows you to bring the data in and out. So it can be uh, used as an ETL tool uh, as well, right? Then provide capability of querying and analysis, right? So Hive allows you to query the data. We already know that. Hive QL is similar to SQL, so it's very easy to understand. You can perform analytics on large data sets. So Hive doesn't uh, 
really tell you that how big should be the data, any kind of data you can analyze, reduce the need to write complex MapReduce programs. Uh, where not to use Hive? So this can be a good point. So what are some of the situations where you should not use Hive? First of all, when the data to be processed is less than a GB. See, if you're having small amount of data, never come to big data platform, never come to Hadoop, never come to Hive. You can use your traditional uh, approach. So very, re very recently, I went into uh, a company, not very recently, like six months back as a consultant. So this company was actually, uh, looking to migrate to Hadoop. Okay, so they called me to discuss uh, how can they migrate to Hadoop and, and, and what are the tools they need to use. Uh, they are already running some applications. Will they work on Hadoop? So when I went to them, uh, they are a Hyderabad based company. The first question I asked to them is, you know, why do you want to migrate? How much data do you have? So they said they have around 100 GB data, total, around 100 GB data. Then I asked them, what are the tools you are currently using? So they are primarily using Oracle. And then I asked, in the upcoming years, are you going to get more data? They said, not much. I suggested, don't migrate to Hadoop. It's a waste, actually. So it is not like every company on Earth should migrate to Hadoop, no. So when your amount of data is less, also you are not expecting a lot of data, also you are not having unstructured data, you don't have to come to Hive or Hadoop. You can stay with whatever you want. So that is the first point when the data is less than, let's say GBs actually. Uh, second option is when finding schema is difficult or not possible on the data. So do not go to Hive if you cannot find schema on the data. To give you an idea, if you have a CSV file, you can safely say that I can create a table that will have the same columns like the CSV file. You can load the file, you can query the file. But imagine you have like a plain text file. Okay, Let, let's say you are having, uh, you are, you are, let's say you are collecting log files or web browser data, right? Let's say you are collecting, you are doing something like web scraping. Uh, in the world of Python, uh, there is a technique called web scraping. Web scraping basically means you are uh, logging onto websites and then collecting all the data that is displayed in the website. So what happens in that case is that you are having unstructured data, right? You don't have rows or columns, it's like, uh, unstructured data. So in that case, please don't use Hive, right? Because you cannot convert that into a row column format, right? It is very difficult actually, right? So uh, that is a second option that we have. Uh, and then the next is when the response is needed in seconds, right? So what that means, uh, if you are writing a Hive query, one of the thing you need to understand is that Hive will first read your query, then it has to convert your query into MapReduce, then the MapReduce job has to run. So Hive queries are typically slow. They are not like super fast, that is for sure. So if your requirement is that, okay, uh, I want to create a data warehouse where you know the queries have to be like really fast. I need the output in seconds and all. Hive is not your choice. So if you are wondering if Hive is not the choice, what will I do? There are other SQL engines on Hadoop. Hive is not the only SQL engine. We have Impala, we have Drill, we have Spark SQL. There are many SQL engines actually, but Hive on one hand is not really a fast SQL engine. So if you need a query outputs 
uh, within seconds and all, then highway is not your cho um, choice. The last point in the slide, when it is possible to solve a problem by RDBMS. So if you can solve the problem by RDBMS, never come to Hive. Uh, some of the other features of Hive, uh, it stores schema in a database and processed data into HDFS. Uh, I will explain this topic in detail as to what you mean by it stores schema in a database, right? Uh, second point, it is designed for OLAP. What is OLAP? Online Analytical Processing. So do not think that Hive is a database. So that is one mistake many people do. Many people believe that, okay, Hive also understands SQL. So Hive is also an RDBMS. No, Hive is not a database. You ideally cannot do insert, update, delete queries in Hive. In an RDBMS, the purpose of an RDBMS is actually to perform insert, update, delete operations, right? But in case of Hive, the purpose is more or less running analytical queries, meaning I already have some data, I load it into Hive. I'm not going to modify the data, I'm gonna ask questions. So if you look at my uh, Big Bazaar example, right? In the Big Bazaar example, look at my MySQL. In the Big Bazaar example, look at MySQL. MySQL is the backend of your billing application, right? So every day, probably thousands or lakhs of rows will be inserted in MySQL because more people buying things from Big Bazaar, more number of rows will be inserted. So that is the use case of an RDBMS. An RDBMS allows you to do insert, update, delete, probably millions of rows. But later, what you do, you collect all this data from MySQL, Microsoft, PostgreSQL, and dump it in something like Hive. So Hive is also a data warehouse. So inside Hive, when you get the data, you don't want to modify the data because this data is actually coming from your billing application. So why do you want to modify? Rather, you want to ask questions to the data or aggregated queries to the data. So in case of Hive, what we do is that we load the data, which is already collected, then we ask analytical questions to the data. That is this point. The second point. Third point, it provides SQL type language. We know that. It is familiar, fast, scalable, and extensible. So you may be wondering why it is written fast. So fast, it just says that on a big data platform, it is actually faster. But when you compare Hive with an RDBMS or something, you can see it is considerably slower. Now, Hive and Pig comparison, this is something which people usually want to do because both the tools achieve similar uh, result. Whether you are using Hive or Pig, it can analyze big data and give you output. So Hive is a declarative language, whereas Pig is a procedure language, one difference. Uh, and Hive operate on the server side of a cluster. So when you are installing Hive, it run on a server. Pig is actually a client side utility. There is nothing called a pig server. And Hive stores the metadata in a dedicated RDBMS. Uh, pig doesn't save the metadata or schema anywhere. And Hive uses SQL syntax, pig is using scripting. So we will uh, see these differences later. Uh, right now, if I look at the differences, it may not be so clear. We will see that, okay? Now let's look at the Hive architecture before that. Uh, let me know if you have any queries. We'll pick up some questions. So Shubham was saying that mostly data is unstructured. No, mostly data is structured. You will be surprised. 90% of data is structured. 
you, even I was thinking the same thing. When I started working with uh, uh, big data, right? I also learned that, okay, it is structured and structured and analysis. But I was surprised to show that 90% of data is structured. Okay? Why? Because of the business requirements. See, uh, if you're working for a bank, right? Let's say you're working for a bank. What kind of a data a bank will handle? Customer transaction, loan details, credit card information. These are all structured data, right? It is highly unlikely that the bank will do a video analytics, right? I don't know. I have never encountered such a situation. On the other hand, if you're working for an e-commerce company, probably there are chances. I'm not saying unstructured data is not there, okay? If you're working for an e-commerce company, let's say somebody like, uh, you know, Flipkart, they also work with structured data mostly, a little bit of unstructured data as well. Where the unstructured data will become useful is for machine learning. Unstructured data is useful if you are going to the machine learning side of things. To give you an example, uh, take Facebook as an example. What is Facebook doing? Facebook is definitely doing image analysis. Images are unstructured data, right? Facebook is doing image analysis. What kind of image analysis? If you upload a picture into Facebook, it will automatically tag you, right? Or it will at least give you suggestions for tagging faces and all. So definitely Facebook is reading your image and, and doing some image analysis. Is that a normal big data problem? No, it's a machine learning problem. Image analysis is a machine learning problem Probably they are using a platform like Hadoop to store it, but end of the day, the analysis is part of machine learning. Okay, or, or if you are talking about something else, so let us uh, say that you are not talking about images. Let us say you are talking about video files. I'm talking about video files. I'm collecting CCTV footage from, let's say, I don't know, city. So let us assume you want to capture, uh, so this is the lockdown situation, right? Now it is a lockdown situation. So let's say the government of India want to capture all the CCTV footage and check how many people are roaming around so they can arrest them and all. Now, is it a big data problem? Yes, because if you're collecting all the CCTV footage in a city or in a state, that's like terabytes and petabytes of data. But then, how do you identify whether Raghu is roaming in the street? Machine learning. So ultimately, whenever you have unstructured data, it turns out to be a machine learning problem. Now, you can store videos on Hadoop, you can store images on Hadoop, but you cannot write a SQL query on an image, right? Doesn't make any sense. So when you, when you want to analyze an image or analyze a video, mostly machine learning or deep learning comes into picture. Tushar was saying, does Hive work with NoSQL data? Now, primarily Hive works with the data that you store on Hadoop, HDFS. But Hive can also read the data from a NoSQL platform. So let us say you have something like Cassandra, just to give an example. Let's say you have some data in Cassandra. Cassandra is a NoSQL database. Hive can connect with Cassandra and read the data, okay? So if you look at the Hive architecture, uh, there is a small mistake here, not a mistake, but uh, you see there is something called user interface, okay? Uh, what do you mean by user interface? User interface is how do you connect with Hive, okay? So user interface, you can see there is a web UI, so Hive, allows you to query the data using a web UI. And I can straight away show you that. We will learn Hive, but uh, I will show you this web UI. So if I go to this tool called Hue, I can just go to query, you can see Hive here. So I can write a query, select star from, so I already have some tables. Let's say taxi data limit, 10. 
click the play button hi will run my sql query so there is a table called taxi data and i will get the output let's see yes this is the output of the query can you see so hive actually run this and you can see the output of the query see this is the output of the query so this is the gui that you can use for hive uh, we will learn how to create a table and all later but in this example i have already created some tables right and if i want to query them one thing i can use is the graphical user interface so there is a gui from there you can type the command any sql query you can write here for example i can say i don't know what are the uh, columns we have hmm. problem is it is not actually showing all the columns give me a moment okay see there are many columns but it is actually um, uh, these are all the columns we have rate code extra etc uh, we will see that so one way to work with hive is that there is a gui where you can write a sql query and hive will run the query for you the second way is hive command line i will show you this hive command line is a cli a command line interface you can open that and then write all the hive commands or queries or anything that you want uh, this hd insight don't worry about it see uh, that is what i said it is a mistake it's not a mistake as such see hd insight is a cloud platform for hadoop so what what it says in the slide is that you can also query from hd insight it is just an extra information don't worry about it but when you are writing a query what is happening there is a very important concept called meta store you can see here so what is this meta store this meta store is an rdbms why do you need an rdbms inside hive so when you are creating tables in hive the metadata of the tables will be stored in an rdbms see what you do normally is that you will say create a table and then you will load the data start querying the data so when you are creating a table the table will have what the column names the data types who created the table when the table was created who can access the table all this metadata related to the table is stored in a in a place called meta store meta store is actually any rdbms you can configure any rdbms as the meta store and here you can see there is a hive processing engine so it will read your query uh, the execution engine is map reduced and the data will be on hdfs or hbase okay now i can show you hive we will look at hive right shubham was saying like for giving real time analysis uh, on a video feed then then hive cannot be used for that okay shubham for giving real time analysis on a video feed hive cannot be used for sure you have to use a combination of machine learning and something else like i have not done that but if you are if you are talking about video analysis uh, it is definitely a machine learning job not a hive job for sure so there are many platforms which support image analysis video analysis on the fly shubham so if you are interested you can check out amazon so in amazon cloud if you log in you can see the none of their platform let me just log on to my amazon account give me a moment i'm just logging on if i go to services in amazon uh, this is amazon cloud actually there are a lot of machine learning uh, pack, uh, packages here there is something called recognition 
So what you can do, you can use this service. So recognition, Amazon recognition is a machine learning service. It's basically a deep learning service. So you can upload an image or you can uh, upload a video and it'll analyze and give you the details. So uh, you can, uh, so for example, you can do object and scene detection. You can do facial analysis. You can do uh, video analysis. So I can go to video analysis, right? So this is video analysis, okay. And what you can do, you can upload your video. So in this example, uh, we have uploaded, uh, uh, you know, a sample video. Let me see if I can find a video just to show you this. Give me a moment. Mm, you can say star dot mp4. Uh, <laughs> so I was looking for some videos on my PC. Uh, I don't have a lot of videos actually. Let me search and see if I can find, okay. Star dot mp4. What is this? Give me one moment, okay. After Lacroix had to handle in 2005. Uh, no, I'll, I'll probably show that later, but let's say you uploaded a video. So this is the video. So you can see there is a video. If I play the video, uh, so this is Jeff Bezos talking. See, see, I'm playing the video. So I just, I, I just uploaded a video where Amazon's owner, Jeff Bezos is talking, imagine, right? The system, the deep learning system will go through the video it will identify who are the people in that. For example, you can see uh, these are the people, there are two celebrities. It will also say that in this video, there is a human, there can be an audience, there can be a cow, crowd, there is a chair, there is a bird, a person had a bird, you know, and all these things it will identify from the video. So for analyzing video and all, uh, it's not a Hadoop uh, solution. So you have to use machine learning or deep learning libraries. Amazon recognition is one of the service I know personally, right? So my company is actually working on some of the solutions on Amazon recognition. So what we do is that uh, we, are, we are designing a system wherein you see if you are living in a flat, right? What happens uh, if you are living in a flat and if you are using a car, Every time you want to enter the flat, the security will uh, basically look at your car and say that, hey, are you living here or not? But what our system does is that it will capture the uh, still and video of the car, including the number plate, and the system will match it. And the system will automatically tell the security that, hey, this guy is living in the flat, right? Yeah, so basically video is nothing but sequence of photos. So is it as good as you will be using image recognition feature for analyzing video? Now video is basically a sequence of photos, but there can be a lot of comparison and all, right? Individual images and videos are totally different, right? So comparisons are totally different. So video analysis itself is totally different. It is completely different than image analysis. But my point is that is not falling within what we are discussing. We are not talking about video analysis. We are talking about mostly structured data and semi-structured data. In, in Hadoop or big data platforms, we also deal with something called semi-structured data. A classic example will be XML files, JSON files, because many applications will give you the data in this format. Uh, if you're talking about this, IOT devices, internet of things, sensor data. Let's say you want to capture sensor data. The sensor data by default comes in JSON format. Key value pairs, right? So those kind of data, you know, this, this platform, our Hadoop, Spark, Hive, they will be able to analyze. But you can even analyze complete and structured data but a better service for that will be machine learning, right? For example, facial recognition or anything like that, then deep learning is much more powerful rather than using our traditional analytics. 
So, like I said, I was talking about the Hive architecture. Uh, we will see Hive in action. Uh, that will be probably what we can do. So, let us take a quick break. I will write it here. So, I will say that we are on break. We'll resume at 8.15. Thank you.
Welcome back, everyone. Um, <clears throat> any questions? Let's see. Uh, let me pick up the questions window, okay? Give me a moment. Uh, do you guys have, uh, you can just post it in the chat window, okay? If you have any questions, you can post it in the chat window. I will see whether there are already any questions, then I will pick it up. Okay, if already some questions are there, I will pick it up. Mm, I don't see any. No, <clears throat> right? So what we are going to do now is we are going to see how to work with Hive, which is rather easy in my opinion. So working with Hive is uh, almost like working with uh, any SQL platform that you are aware of. So we will continue Hive classes tomorrow. So today we will do something. Tomorrow also there will be some part of the continuation of the Hive class, right? Now let's take a case study. If you give me a moment, I'll pick up the case study, okay? Mm. Give me one moment, okay? Okay, yeah, <clears throat> great, uh, thank you. So uh, what we are going to do here is, uh, let us understand Hive by picking up a case study, okay? And here is the case study. <clears throat> so we have a data set called yellow.csv. Now, if you, if you understand about uh, USA, right? Uh, in New York, you have this yellow cab. Have you seen yellow cabs in New York? Yellow taxi, they call it, no? So you can say New York yellow cab. This is the taxi in New York. Have you guys seen? At least in movies and all, you could have seen, right? I don't know, maybe some of you had been to US also, right? So if you, if you ever visit uh, New York, right, you get a taxi called yellow taxi. It's called yellow taxi. You also have Uber and all, right? But, but this is the popular uh, taxi in New York. So we have collected uh, the data from these taxi rides. That is the CSV file. So if you look at the CSV file, uh, each record is actually a trip. And there are multiple columns for this CSV file. Now, if you want to understand what these columns mean, so here it is, there is another PDF file. So the first column is called vendor ID. So it is a code indicating the provider that provided the record. So see, there are two vendors basically, one and two. So very phone is there. Creative Mobile is there. So they are the vendors for them. So the first column you can see is the vendor ID. So this is the vendor ID. You have only two values, uh, one and two. Then you have pickup date time, drop off de date time and passenger count. So pickup date time is, you know, the date and time of the pickup of the cab. Drop off date time is the of course, the drop of uh, date and time. This passenger is number of passengers in the cab. Okay, so this will be entered by the driver, whether one person was there, two people, three people, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. <clears throat> uh, then you have something called a trip distance. So trip distance is in miles. So here you can see uh, what was the the distance for the trip, like one mile, two mile, or whatever it is. Uh, then you have something called PU location ID and DO location ID, right? Uh, so these are like location IDs are related to taxi. We are not really interested in this. And then there is something called rate code ID. 
<clears throat> right so what is this rate code so there are like six different things one is standard rate second is jfk so this is to the airport jfk is the airport then there is something called new arc uh, if you are going to that place nassau then code five means the negotiated fare code six means group ride so by looking at these numbers one two three four five six you can understand whether it was a trip to airport whether it was a group ride or, or something like that you know so after this you are having something called store and forward flag another column so this flag indicates whether the trip record was held in vehicle memory before sending to the vendor uh, because the vehicle did not have a connection to the server so this is not really important for our analysis uh, this is like whether the taxi was directly connected to the internet or not okay then you have something called payment type so maybe payment type is interesting for us so these are the different uh, values for payment uh, type so if the payment type is one the passenger used a credit card or cash there is no charge dispute unknown you know, there are different different uh, so each trip might have some different thing then you have the fare amount so the time and distance were calculated by the meter uh, then there is an extra column so this is like uh, you know extra charge like during the peak hours they charge like half a dollar extra uh, then there is something called tax column it's called mta tax uh, so that is the metro tax that they add in the trip then there is an improvement surcharge value uh, then there is a tip amount so see uh, in in us or especially in new york and all when you catch a cab automatically the tip will be generated it is not like you are giving the tip tip will be part of your standard fare then any amount you paid for the toll and the final total amount so these are the different columns uh, that we have in the data set you can see there is vendor id pickup date drop off date number of passengers distance rate code then uh, you know you have payment type credit card cash fare amount you have extra then you have tax and you have total amount so given this data we want to analyze this data and and uh, you know get some uh, insights from the data <clears throat> right so what we want to do we want to use hive to read this data and then uh, create a table out of it and then you know uh, we want to analyze the data so let's try to do that okay so the first step that we need to do is that we have to upload this data in hadoop also let me look at this pdf file if you give me a moment uh give me <laughs> Yeah, so what I'm going to do uh, right now is that uh, the first thing I have to ensure that the data is in Hadoop. So I'm just going to files menu in Hadoop and I'm just going to upload the data. So this is yellow.csv. Let me drag and drop. Let me upload the data into Hadoop. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, the data is uploaded now called yellow.csv. It is in Hadoop. Uh, now, how do you start working with Hive? So what you can do, you can open the web console. And then you can say, So in order to work with Hive, like I said, either you can use the graphical user interface or you can use the command line. Uh, mostly what we prefer in the industry is the command line, okay? So you can just type Hive uh, and it will open something called Hive shell for you. 
So as you can see, this is called your hive shell. So yesterday we have seen the pig shell. This is the hive shell. So in hive, the first thing that we do normally when we try to do some analysis is that we create something called a database. Okay, so how do you create a database in Hive? It's actually very simple. You can say create database, let's say uh, board infinity. So in order to create a database, <clears throat> you just need to say create database and then the database name. So in my example, the database name is board infinity. And then you have to say use the database. So you have to say use, let's say board infinity. So I just said uh, use this uh, uh, database. And now what we are supposed to do, we are supposed to create a table to load our data, the CSV file. Now, how do you create a table in Hive? It's actually very simple. Let me copy the command from here and I will explain the command as well. Don't worry. Yes. So don't worry about the length of the command. I mean, it, it's okay. So I'm saying create table if not exist taxi data. So the name of my table is actually taxi data. And I'm saying that create table if not exist. This means if already there is a table, it will not create it. But in our example, there is no previous table. So it is going to create the table. Now within brackets, I'm mentioning my schema. So Hive supports all the regular data types. So you can see that the first column is vendor ID, that's a string. Then pick up date time, I'm keeping it as string. Well, I can use a timestamp for this, but I'm using string right now. Uh, drop off date time, again string. Passenger count is integer. Trip distance is decimal, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I'm mentioning all the column names and data types I want in here, okay? Then I will say row format delimited fields terminated by comma. What is this? This means my input data is comma separated. So whenever you are creating uh, a table in Hive, okay, typically what you do is that after you create the table, you will be loading one file or more than one file. So you have to ensure that in the table creation statement, in your DDL statement, the delimiter of the file is mentioned. So in this example, you can see that the delimiter is comma. Uh, my file is comma separated. And then you say stored as text file. So what is this uh, stored as text file? Uh, this basically means uh, whatever data that you are loading into this table will be stored as a regular text file, okay? Uh, you may be wondering, hey, I already have a CSV file that is in the text format, then why this is so important? This is important because you can also use other options instead of stored as text file, I can say stored as parquet file, stored as ORC file. So what is this parquet, ORC and all? They are compression formats. So you can compress the data inside a Hive table. So as of now, we are not doing that. We are storing it as a regular table. Then you say table properties, skip header line count equal to one. This basically means don't read the first line. See in the CSV file, uh, okay, close the CSV file. If you look at the CSV file, the first line will be the header. So you don't want to read the header as the data. So you are saying that skip one line, then read your data. So as you can see, the table is created. 
now how do you load the data so i can say show tables so when i say show tables uh, you can clearly see that there is the taxi data table which we have just now created now in order to load the data you can just say load data in path <clears throat> then you give the location uh, user slash yellow dot csv into table uh, taxi data so this is the command to load the file into the table now you may be naturally wondering what do you really mean by loading the file is the file going somewhere some place i will come back to that right yeah so where is this data where is this created where is the file actually going i i will show you that later like what is happening behind the scenes as of now when you run this command it will load the file into the table called taxi data now let's see whether this table is actually queryable so what we can do we can say select star from taxi data i can say limit 5 yes as you can see i am able to run a very simple query a select star query but the data is inside the table now when you run a select star query it will not convert to a map reduce job so i told you that any hive query that you run it is going to convert your query into uh, uh, you know a map reduce job right um, so in this example when you simply run a select star query uh, it is not going to convert to map reduce select star queries are more or less like read up queries they don't um, fire a map reduce job but i can run another query i can say select count star from taxi data this will fire a map reduce job so select count star what is this query this query basically count the number of records in the table now i am assuming that you are having good knowledge of sql uh, you are expected to have to understand hive otherwise we can give you some uh, places to learn but unfortunately in the training uh, you know we will not be able to cover the basics of sql query so i am i'm assuming that you guys are having some basic idea about sql query so when i ran this <clears throat> query called select count star from the table you can see that <clears throat> it fired a map reduce job here you can see the map reduce job running it says map 0 reduce 0 then it says map 100 reduce 0 so you can see the statistics finally you can see the output so we have 10,000 rows of data. Now let us run some basic queries to uh, and, uh, check whether Hive is able to run our query. For example, uh, one of the query that I might want to run is, let's say uh, you already checked count star. Let's say you want to find out what is the total revenue generated by all trips. Okay, so I want to know what is the total revenue i got from all the taxi trips so there is a column called total amount so i can run this query i can say select sum of total amount as total revenue from taxi data so what is this query you are just writing a sum on this total amount column so total amount column will have the total amount for each trip i can do a sum of total amount and and this query will be fired and we will be able to get uh, the total revenue from the trips so let's just wait for this so as you can see each query is taking some time because it is converting to map reduce now please hold on with your questions i will get back to your questions after my demonstration um, so I will give you time to ask questions, but 
first let's concentrate on what is happening and then we can discuss the questions so as you can see the total fare is actually 160546 dollars or whatever it is right uh, another thing what fraction of total is paid for tolls so i know that there is a total amount column and then there is a toll amount column i want to know what percentage of the total amount generally is given for toll so you can actually do a sum of toll amount divided by sum of total amount from the table so you are getting like a percentage value so i can say select sum of toll amount divided by sum of total amount from the table right so this will divide uh, you know total toll amount by total uh, amount and let's run this query so each query is firing a map reduce job as you can see and let's see what is the percentage of total you given as toll amount so let it run <clears throat> so as you can see the output is 0 0.01555 this is the value so you can say roughly one percentage because you have to multiply this with 100 to get the percentage values if i multiply this value by 100 what will i be getting uh, i will be getting one right so i can say that around roughly one uh, or 1.5 percentage uh, you are giving as toll amount okay now what is the other you can also say what fraction of it is driver tips so i want to check you know uh, i have something called uh, uh, tip amount which is what i give for the driver what fraction i am giving to the driver as tip from the total amount so how will the query look like select sum of trip amount divided by sum of total amount so from the total amount you are paying what percentage is going to tip for the driver let's see that let's wait for a moment and the answer is 0 0.10 so roughly 10 percentage is going as tip to the driver so look at that uh, roughly one percentage is what we saw tall amount right but roughly 10 percentage is actually driver uh, tip that you are giving right we can also see what is the average trip amount so there are like 10,000 trips i want to know on an average what is uh, that a person will pay so you can do a select average of this column total amount see the average value so statistically speaking what will be an average uh, you know uh, uh, amount that we will be paying right so if i run this query you can see that 16 dollars so on an average people are actually paying somewhere around 16 dollars now i have also written some more queries here you can just go through them uh, if you want for example another query let me just check is for each payment type display the flow following details so you see there are different different payment types for each payment type i want to look at average fare average tip and average tax so different different payments are there like credit card this that for each of them i want to get this so i can write a slightly more complex query it's not a complex query actually but i'm saying select payment type and i want to uh, get average fare amount average tip amount average tax from the taxi data group by payment type oops why it is throwing an error uh, i think there was some parsing exception so let's see if i can run this in a single line okay 
So sometimes what happens when you run this, right? From taxi data, grew by payment type. Hey, there is some logical mistake in this syntax. Can somebody identify? Let's run the query once more and check whether it is working, okay? I will probably get back to you later on that query. There can There is some small mistake in the query. Uh, but let's say what is the average distance of the trip so you can actually run this query so the idea is just to demonstrate that you can run query so the queries are going to be very similar like a sql query the hive queries are in fact 99 percentage similar to a sql query that is what we saw right so if you are comfortable with sql you will be able to run all these queries okay now what is happening behind the scenes that is some of some of us so if i say show tables you can see that we created a table called taxi data taxi data is the name of the table and hive supports hive supports two types of tables one there is something called managed table. Second, there is something called external table. So there are two types of tables you can create in Hive. Something called managed table, something called external table. By default, any table that you create is going to be a managed table. This is the default uh, table. And what we created, our taxi table, this is actually the default table. I mean, this is a managed table. How do you know that this is a managed table? You can just go to Hive Shell. You can say describe formatted uh, taxi data. So when I describe the table, I can see so many things. For example, when I run the describe command, uh, you can see that these are the column names and data types in my table. Then which database the table actually belongs to, who is the owner of the table, when the table was created, et cetera, et cetera. But I also see an information called table type managed table. So this is how you check whether it is a managed table or an external table. Now, what do you really mean by managed table? Managed table basically means Hive is going to manage your data. So you can see something called location here. See, there is something called uh, location, right? So whenever you create a database and a table in Hive, let's see what happens. So when you install Hive for the first time, Hive will create a directory called warehouse directory in Hadoop. So I am in Hadoop and I am just going to this uh, folder called user. And in, inside the user folder, there is a folder called, oops, Hive. Give me a moment. Yeah, Hive. Inside that, oops. Okay, okay, sorry, uh, apps, high warehouse, I'm sorry. So there is a folder called apps inside that hive, inside that warehouse, can you see? So whenever you are installing hive, it will create this folder structure called apps, hive, warehouse in Hadoop. If you open this warehouse directory on Hadoop, you can see all the databases you have created. For example, I can search for the board infinity database here. So when you said that create database board infinity, what is happening behind the scenes is that 
Hive is creating a folder, a directory in this location, apps Hive warehouse. If I open this folder, what do I see? I see another folder called taxi data. So when you create a table, in fact, Hive is creating a folder inside the DB. And if I open this table, I see the file I loaded. So when you load the file into a Hive table, the file is just getting copied into this location. That is what is happening behind the scenes, right? So what is happening here is that when you are creating a table and loading the data, the data is getting copied into this particular location. You cannot change it. That is why it is called a managed table. Managed table means Hive is going to manage your data. You don't have a control. You just say load the data. It will always keep the data in apps, Hive, warehouse, DB folder, table folder, and the data there. So Hive is going to manage your data. That is why it is called managed table. So as you can see, the file is here. In fact, if I delete this file from here, if I say delete the file, what will happen? Now the file is gone, okay? And if I try to query now, select star from taxi data, nothing. Since the file is deleted, nothing is present in the table now. Now, if you want to upload the file, you can just upload in this location. I can go here, drag this file, and load in this location. And now I will be able to query the data again. See? So it is just a matter of keeping the file in this particular directory. So what did we learn? We learned how to create a database and how to create a table within the database. Uh, then we loaded the file. Once you load the file into the table, it appears inside this directory. And then you will be able to write any normal SQL query on the table. But one thing, whatever SQL query that you are writing will be converted into a series of MapReduce programs. Okay, so now I will pick up some questions. Prasanna was asking, is this database created in HDFS? I think I have answered your question, Prasanna. Shubham was saying, why the columns are given then when creating the table? Okay, Shubham, uh, you have to give the column name. Hive cannot automatically read and understand them from the CSV. That facility is not there in Hive. So no matter whichever file you are uh, loading into Hive, CSV or Excel or JSON, you have to design, you have to define the schema upfront. Okay, then only it will be able to load the data. Column names and data types, you have to keep in your DDL statement. Okay. Uh, Prasanna, can we load the local file into Hive table? Yes, uh, I will show you an example of that Prasanna. So let me delete this file. Okay, I'm gonna delete the file. Now I'm gonna get the file locally. So what I'm going to do, this is my Linux, right? Uh, let's, let me copy this file once more here. So what I'm trying to do, I'm running a command. It's called hdfs dfs hyphen get yellow.csv here. So I'm just demonstrating how you can load the file if the file is on your local file system like Linux, right? So here you can see that my, the file called yellow.csv is on my Linux. It is not on Hadoop. If I want to load this file, I can open Hive. And I can say use board infinity. I can say load data local in path. You have to use this option called local in path. 
And then you say slash home slash 3825 slash yellow.csv into table taxi data. So Prasanna, the only difference is that if the file is in local file system, you have to say load data local in path, local. You have to use the keyword called local. Then you can load from local file system. Uh, Shubham is asking which platform is this? Cloud Lab. So this platform is called Cloud X Lab. This platform, I think Shubham, we talked about this in the first class, right? So Cloud X Lab is a paid platform, but you can also try this Shubham. They will give you a one week trial. So if you sign up with Cloud X Lab, they will give you a one week free trial uh, to, to try their platform. They will not charge you anything. They basically have uh, a seven node Hadoop cluster in the cloud. You can just connect and practice any technology related to big data. So I use them for all the demos and all, and that is what I have done. Any other questions in Hive, let me know. Uh, uh, let me know if I have missed something. Anything that you want to discuss? Probably I'll give you a minute to think about. Okay, and like um, downloading from Cloudera. No, this has nothing to do with the Cloudera Shobham. This has nothing to do with Cloudera. Okay, it is a company. Cloudex Lab is actually a company. They have set up a Hadoop cluster in the Amazon cloud. You can pay some money and access it for practice. That's all. Uh, I will show you that tomorrow, Prasanna, because I got your question. Uh, there are two types of tables in Hive, managed table and external table. So tomorrow I will show you what is the difference between a managed table and external table. What will happen if you drop or delete a managed table? What will happen if you drop or delete an external table, etc.? So Shubham says, in my system, if I want to work on Hadoop, uh, if you want to work on Hadoop on your system, uh, you can download a virtual machine package, Shubham, right? So what you can do, you can just go to, I'll give you the link for that, Cloudera. Okay. And let's say products, downloads, I guess. Yeah. So you can download something called Hortonworks Sandbox. What is this? You download this file, it will be a single file. Then you can add it in a virtual machine. The virtual machine will start with uh, uh, Linux with every tool installed related to Hadoop, like Spark, Hive, everything will be installed. So this is the link to download the sandbox. I will give you the link in the chat window. Okay, so you just say that the installation type, virtual box or VMware. So if you choose VMware, you say, let's go. It will download an image for your VMware. You just add it in VMware, start VMware. It will start with a fully functional single node Hadoop cluster. Okay. Any other questions, let me know. No more questions. Okay, so if we have no more questions, we can wind up probably today. Okay, so it's almost like five minutes left. Uh, I wanted to discuss this external tables and their difference and all, but I think probably we will discuss that tomorrow. Today, today if I start it, probably we cannot finish it, right? Pig or Hive is preferred. Both are actually preferred. Okay, so it depends on your comfort level. 
So if you are a SQL person, you will always say that Hive is preferred because it is easy for you. If you are a programming background, if you have programming background, then Pig is preferred. Both are like equally preferred. But in the industry, when you look at it, uh, Pig is almost like extinct. People are not using Pig a lot. Mostly they are using Hive. Okay, so if you are talking about the industry, I will say Hive is mostly preferred. Okay. There are very few companies who are still using Pig, very few. Most of them are into Hive. Okay. Any other questions, guys? Or shall we wind up? So tomorrow there is no class. Uh, the next class will be on Thursday. We will continue with a little bit of uh, Hive more and then we will discuss something called uh, scoop as well. So we have to discuss something called scoop, scoop. Okay, so we will discuss those things. Okay. Great, so let's wind up today and I will see you uh, you know, I will see you uh, Thursday. Thank you.